Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isratel here for Renaissance Periodization. How do you train on a bulk versus a cut? What are the differences? Before we get into that, let's talk about a quick reminder of some training universals in a bunch of our other videos. If you scroll through our channel's history, attend to all these much more specifically. So I'll just speak about them super, super quick. Pretty much always, no matter the phase, you train with great technique. Duh, I'm not gonna explain why. You wanna train with higher stimulus to fatigue ratio exercises. Exercises that really, really mess up your target muscles, aren't super difficult to do emotionally, like rack deadlifts or something, uh, and don't mess up your joints a lot. So those are always a really good idea. Exercises you feel in the muscles versus the joints. Rep ranges that give you the highest SFR. So if you have like, you know, pec flies, if you do them for sets of five to 10, you're like, it just kind of hurts my shoulders. Do them for sets of 10 to 15, you're like, wow, this really messes up my pecs. It's probably better to do pec flies like that, kind of no matter what phase you're in. So you always want the rep ranges to be mostly determined by stimulus to fatigue ratio, not anything else we say. And we will say some other stuff that should just bias it a little bit one way or the other. SFR at the end of the day is the predominant reason you choose your rep ranges as you do with a per muscle group frequency of at least twice per week, all right? What that means is if you want a real best effort of trying to grow your pecs as big as possible or not lose any pec size on a fat loss plan, no matter which one you do, you should be training your pecs at least twice a week, and maybe as many as four times per week. To the end of total frequency, um, and this is a kind of an understatement, but I think it bears mention, if you make a serious attempt at muscle gain, a real serious attempt at fat loss while you retain muscle, you probably wanna train at least four total sessions per week, okay? Does that mean you get no results with three total sessions? No, you can get great results, but like, like you're not winning the Mr. Olympia resistance training three times a week. And you're not gonna take your genetic abilities, your environmental abilities, like how much food you're eating, how much rest you're getting, and maximize them with three days a week. With four days, like that's like a, that's a good solid effort. True high level bodybuilders probably need to be training five or six times a week, and even more perhaps with two a day sessions, uh, in my view, but like, I'll put it to you this way. If you are really struggling with putting on mass and I find out you lift twice a week or three times a week, one of my first things I'll say to you is like, you should probably lift like four times a week at least, right? Give four times a week a shot and you'll probably have much better results, right? Um, another point that always holds, you wanna train about three to zero reps from failure, reps in reserve. So if you're training with six reps in reserve, it's too easy. If you're always grinding beyond failure, it's probably too hard and too much fatigue for the stimulus you get. So between three and zero RIR always holds. And from your minimum effective volume to your maximum recoverable. If you're training mostly at your maximum recoverable, you're probably wasting your time quite a bit. Training mostly at your minimum effective, you're probably wasting your time quite a bit too. So that really productive middle ground, probably throughout that whole middle ground, is just good practice for any phase. That being said, let's get into some special circumstances on a cut. So being that you start with normal training, how do we change that training slightly, and it is slightly, it's not completely different, to make sure that we're getting as much out of the cut as possible. First, do not specialize. Okay, there's no such thing as a pec priority cutting phase. Why? Because if you do more pecs and you have a certain systemic MRV, you have to do less of something else, like less forearms or less biceps because there's only so much fatigue you can sum up. Interestingly enough, on a cut, that systemic MRV impinges much more because your ability to clear fatigue is lower on a cut, less food, and you sum fatigue more highly because of all the cardio and other things that you're doing. So that's even more of a concern. What you wanna do is you wanna spread your volume as evenly as possible around to all of the muscles that you wanna save to have to be their same size or close at the end of a cut. So instead of doing way more chest and way less biceps, if you do that, we'll talk about what happens in your, to your chest in just a sec, but you may lose some bicep size and that's not great. Uh, the number one goal of a cut, as far as resistance training, is conserving all the muscle that you have, which means you need to spread your volume pretty evenly or at least attend to all of the minimum effective volumes of every single muscle group. Now, you may say, okay, yeah, I'll lose my biceps a bit, but my pecs will get huge. Bullshit. On a cut, you don't have the resources, the food, the rest, so on and so forth, to maximize muscle hypertrophy for a specific muscle. If you're not a beginner or early intermediate, the best you can hope for is that you lose no muscle on a cut. You don't hope for growth on a cut. That tends to be either very small in magnitude or relatively rare. So if you're intermediate or advanced, you're blasting your pecs like crazy on a cut. We already know that that's taking away volume and systemic fatigue from other muscles that could be shrinking on you. But what is it doing for your pecs? 
probably a whole lot of nothing because there's just not enough food to get your pecs to grow. There's not that hypercaloric environment, which for advanced folks is almost necessary for them to make progress. So if you're going to specialize, hint, hint, wink, wink, that's for the next slide. That's uh, what to do on a bulk. Okay. So specializing in cut uh, outside of really specific circumstances, like the judges said, you need to bring in bigger lats and your shows in eight weeks, something like that. Other than that, not a good idea. Point number two, you want to err on slightly higher frequencies. Lower frequencies can be very anabolic. That is, you can train once every week, make a huge muscle gain, and then because you're on a bulk, you, there's enough food and, and stuff like that floating around hormonally, you just don't lose any muscle that whole week. So you gain a bunch first half of the week, and then it stays uh, the same, and then you hit it again and you gain again. That's totally fine. In a cutting phase, there's a sort of like pervasive net catabolic environment. So when your muscles stop gaining, they kind of start losing. So what you want to do, and that's relative gaining, and they're gaining and losing at the same time, which basically means they're flatline. For that reason, slightly higher frequencies are probably better when cutting. So if you normally train your legs once a week on a mass that may actually are on a bulk, whatever terminology you want to use, that's probably okay. And if it's working for you, great. When you start cutting, I would switch to at least twice a week for legs. Because if you train your legs on Monday, by the weekend on a cut, you may be losing a little bit of quad size. First couple of weeks, you won't be able to tell. Last couple of weeks, you're like, fuck, man, my legs just aren't what they used to be. I'm losing some poundage on the lifts. They look a little flat. And that's because you may not have been training them at least twice a week. So air a little bit on the higher frequency side. Number three, you want to choose exercises that are more attentive to the stimulus to fatigue ratio, the SFR and a little bit less attentive to raw stimulus magnitude, RSM. Now, raw stimulus magnitude is how much just fucking growth an exercise causes, uh, regardless of how much fatigue it causes. The deadlift is a perfect example. Will the deadlift give you a big fucking back? Fuck yes, it will. It'll smash your back into size. But on a cut, your total fatigue allotment is lower because the cut is so fatiguing and it allows you to dump so little fatigue over the course of training. Because fatigue is way more constraining, we want to make sure the exercises we use really justify their fatigue with a high relative amount of stimulus. So high SFR moves, maybe like barbell bent rows, maybe like stiff-legged deadlifts, and not as many high raw stimulus magnitude moves like deadlifts. Now, you may retort intelligently that, look, like I'm on a fucking bigger back. I got to use the biggest weapons. Totally. But not during a cut because you don't grow back during a cut. You grow that on a bulk. Right, so higher SFR moves are more prized than usual because they're always prized. But in to put it another way, the high raw stimulus magnitude moves, we might not want to use them as much if they come with a big fatigue cost, but you just can't fucking afford to pay it. Plain and simple, right? Number four, you may want to err slightly on the side of higher reps, just a little bit. Just take all your average reps and bump them up by five, something like that, not in north of 30, right? So if your average reps are already 30, don't go north of that. But if your average reps are like, let's say five on some exercise, maybe go to 10 or something like that. Maybe even a couple, go to eight. Why? It takes a lot of psychological energy to get yourself to doing really big lifts that are really heavy. Probably disproportionately more energy than you get a hypertrophy effect out of that versus higher reps. So if you do a set of five in the squat, you could get real robust hypertrophy. It's fucking pretty tough. A set of 10 in the squat, also very tough, but probably nets you a little bit more hypertrophy than a set of five. T difficult to detect in a lot of meta-analyses, but there's probably something there. Over time, that stuff adds up. And the thing is, normally that's not a problem. Normally you just do whatever's best for growth, but on a cut, you have so little psychological energy to begin with. Maybe it's easier to grind through higher reps than it is to get a real big effort going and get your biggest possible lifts. In addition to that, a lot of the times your leverages on a cutting phase will start to disproportionately be less favorable towards big strength lifts. And then higher reps may actually be a way for you to continue to progress. At least psychologically, it looks nice to be getting stronger, not losing strength. Whereas if you did very low rep stuff, you may actually lose some strength. And it's not you're losing underlying strength. Your range of motion is increasing. And maybe that's uh, something that, uh, you know, psychologically is especially really tough to deal with. Like, fuck, I'm getting weaker. What the hell am I doing here at all? During the course of a cut, on average, your fibers tend to convert from more fast twitch activity to a slightly more slow twitch activity. And because you're losing body fat, your endurance is going up as well from that line. So actually, by doing slightly higher repetitions and potentially adding reps instead of adding load in some weeks, 
you can continue to escalate your performance or at least maintain it better with higher reps on a cut than on a mass. And we'll come back to this on the bulking stuff where the reverse may actually be true for bulking. So just biasing your reps a little bit higher on a cut is probably a good idea. Funny enough, bodybuilders have been doing this for generations anyway, but they make bullshit reasons that aren't actually true to justify the shit that's actually much more humbling, okay? Bodybuilders, you know, coming up close to a, a contest or something or the end of their fat loss phase will say, I'm fucking doing high reps to etch in the details. What the fuck does that even mean? You're in a fucking razor blade doing this shit to your quads? No, no such thing as etching details. However, the real reason they're doing higher reps is because lifting heavy is just no longer as impressive because they can't lift as heavy or the progress they used to see is much lower. There is some argument for injury risk there a little bit. So maybe that's a, a part of it, but they just don't have the energy for big strength lifts and they're not as strong as they used to be or they're not gaining strength as fast as they used to be. So they kind of just pivot like, oh, I'll do higher reps. And it turns out because of the fiber conversion and the lower body fat, they can do reps really, really well. And they're like, wow, this is fucking awesome. I'm getting a ton out of this. And yeah, sure, that works as far as it goes. It doesn't mean you're etching in details, but it still may be a slightly better strategy. It, none of this is dogma, by the way. If you have great cuts doing low reps, fucking keep doing it. But if you get in the situation where halfway through your cut, your strength lifts start to like not look so good, but your high rep stuff looks excellent and it feels great, do a little bit more of that. And I promise you can get all of your rep strength back after you're done cutting, no problem. No matter what rep range is, you just start training in, and voila, it comes right back. Number five, expect your minimum effective volume to be slightly higher. Duh, it makes sense. There's a huge catabolic impetus all the time. You need to do a little bit more work to get that minimum effective volume because it has more catabolism to fight against. Remember, muscle growth is when anabolism exceeds catabolism slightly, and muscle maintenance is when they're tied. Okay, if catabolism is higher than usual, your MEV used to be here. It's not anymore. Minimum effective volume is now here, whatever just exceeds that barrier. So that means on a cutting phase, when you start your mesocycle, you may start with like four or five sets per muscle group per session as opposed to three or four. And you'll actually be able to tell us in your training, it'll take you longer to get a pump. Like it'll, in, and especially later into the cut, interestingly enough, one of our metrics for when you hit, uh, start a hit MEV is you start to really fatigue that local muscle. Performance starts to go down. Deep into a cut, you actually can do a lot of sets of the same or really close reps over and over and over because your endurance is so good, your muscles are so slow twitch, the problem is they're not as likely to be stimulated for hypertrophy, so you have to do more sets to get that rep drop off, more sets to get the pump, and all of a sudden, uh, it takes you know just a little bit more for that minimum effective volume. You think, okay, I can train more, uh, but hold on the sad fucking irony of cutting. Point number six, your MRV will be lower. Your maximum recovery volume has to be lower because the recovery is highly mediated by your nutritional environment. And your nutritional environment is pure fucking dog shit. And also you're doing cardio on top of that. Also cutting is stressful. So the most sets you can do per session and still benefit probably falls as well. Now, if you're looking at it this way, during massing, your minimum effective volume is here. Maximum recovery is here. That means you have a broad range of training and you can go from your MEV and take a long time or jump up in big increments of load or reps and, and sets to get to your MRV. No big deal. When you're cutting, and I'm sure you guys have experienced this before, this window narrows quite a bit so that you have to start with a little bit more training than normally you would and inch up slowly, 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 maybe add a rep every other session, maybe two and a half pounds on the bar every session as, as opposed to every five, if you're actually going to have mesocycles of a decent length. Because if you're used to massing and you're like, fuck, when I leg press on mass, I add 15 pounds to the machine every time and I still hit all my reps, that may last you two weeks on a cut and then all of a sudden you underperform. You're like, what the fuck, am I done? Like, am I deloading after two weeks? That's crazy. The next point will show you how crazy it is. You don't want to deload that frequently. You want to have a nice long accumulation phase or a cut with nice long accumulation phases in it. So you're going to know that your MEV is higher, MRV is lower. That means the repetitions you add, the load you add, and even the sets you add are going to be slower to sort of dope out that longer run. That's a good thing. Number seven, last one for these cutting recommendations. Your deload must be eucaloric. Your deload has to be at maintenance calories because that's what's gonna let you recover. The only purpose of your deload is to drop the fatigue to prepare you for another mesocycle of training and to conserve muscle while doing so. If you are still hypocaloric during deload, if you're still cutting during a deload, how the fuck are either one of those two gonna happen? You're not recovering shit because you're still starving to death. And you're hypocaloric at a time when you're barely training at all. You're going to start to lose muscle. Now, you're not going to lose a ton of muscle. But 
You're going to lose some and much worse, you're not going to drop that fatigue. I know we deload every oh, four to eight weeks. I know it's weird to take a diet break every four to eight weeks, but that's what has to happen for the best possible results. So give that some thought. All right. Lastly, special circumstances, taking your normal training and changing it a little bit on a bulk, on a mass. I always like mass. People say bulk all the time. We're going to see how bulk looks for the YouTube algorithm. Number one, consider specializing. We know that especially for intermediate and advanced individuals, their sum total of muscle group MRVs is higher than their systemic total MRV. Like if you trained everything balls out from its local MEV to MRV, each muscle to its fullest abilities, you are just going to run out of fatigue room and not be able to train everything. So that happens for advanced folks. Specialization is a really good idea. Take half of your body and put it on the back burner. Maintenance volume for half your body, let's say your chest and your back uh, and your hamstrings go to maintenance volume and then your arms and your shoulders, your quads and calves go on full blast MEV to MRV, which is by definition specialization. Really good idea on massing because not only is the best way to grow when you're advanced, but also you have the resources to grow. Remember, we said it was stupid on cutting because there's nowhere to, where are we growing from, right? That's like um, a stupid analogy, but that's like being in, uh, you know, wartime restricted rations and there's not enough steel to go around and you're like, it's time to build the skyscraper even bigger. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? There's no steel. But when it's economic good times, bulking, then there's plenty of steel and you have the resources to do it and voila, it's time, it's time to make that happen, right? Point number two, you want to consider, not necessarily accept, still stimulus to fatigue ratio is king, but you want to consider high raw stimulus magnitude moves, moves that may cost you, exercises that may cost you a ton of fatigue, but they grow so much muscle because that's kind of the whole point of a bulk, it might be worth the trade-off. It's not something you do all the time. But fatigue is less of a concern here because, first of all, a ton of food mitigates a shitload of fatigue. And second of all, if you choose only the most stimulus to fatigue uh, high exercises, the raw stimulus magnitude may not be high enough for those to really power as much growth as, as you would. So when is it time to do fucking reps of deadlifts to get a big back? Bulking. Now that fucking sucks because deadlift and bulking at the same time blows, but it will add slabs of beef. Absolutely 100%. A lot of folks kind of intuitively knew this in bodybuilding. Bulking is when they would start to use big compound heavy exercises. No, it's time to get strong bulking season. Not how, doesn't have a lot to do with strength, but absolutely high raw stimulus magnitudes are just more possible then and also beneficial because they grow so much muscle and the fatigue's not nearly as big of a concern as it is on a cutting phase. Number three. Minimum effective volume may be slightly lower than on maintenance, okay, than normal. That means after just a couple sets of curls, you got a fucking gnarly pump. And you're like, no way. Two sets of curls, bullshit. I need to do four. I usually do four. You do four and your biceps get sore for like a week and a half. You're like, what the fuck happened? Well, when you throw a ton of food and a ton of rest at a system, as is uh, typical in bulking, the adaptive processes are just better and you have to do less to grow muscle. Now, Point number four is MRV is going to be higher because the same food and relaxation that you're throwing at the muscles that makes them so sensitive they grow from less makes them able to survive more. How the fuck do we square those two? What does that mean? Well, that means bulking and cutting average volume and intensity is actually going to be roughly the same. But in bulking properly, you can start lower, easier gains with fewer set numbers, and slowly over the course of the bulk or over the course of each meso, rise to higher MRVs. Or instead of rising to as high of an MRV, come up to the same MRV, but do it several weeks later so that you have more bulk to actually get really, really good growth. So here's what I mean. On a cut, you may be able to put 10 pounds on the leg press twice until you need to deload. On a bulk, you may be able to put 10 pounds on a leg press five times, five distinct sessions because your MEV and MRV is so far apart. It takes a lot of fatigue to rise from one to the other. And within that five times, fuck man, you gained a shitload of muscle. It also means you may start, instead of your week of back training, have an average of 10 sets, you may start productively with an average of eight sets. And instead of stopping at 16 sets, you may stop at 18 sets. Both of those are fucking sweet because both on the top end of your bulk and the bottom end or top end of your mesocycle and bottom end, you've slapped on more growth promoting time, right? And it doesn't matter if you 
add faster or you add at the same speed but go for longer, either way that results in better gains. So give that some thought. A lot of people say, oh man, I'm bulking, I gotta do more. No, 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 you will eventually do more. Start with less and you get the best of both possible worlds. Number five. Deload should be eucaloric. Again, same idea. Now, the first several days after you finished your accumulation phase, you're still sore, recovering, and growing a ton. You can smash food hypercaloric for the first couple of days. But in the last couple of days, if you keep it really hypercaloric, yeah, you, you just feel a little sluggish and you gain a bit of extra fat and you're like, meh. But if you go back to your uh, eucaloric state, as much energy uh, intake as it takes to maintain your body systems, then you know you feel better uh, and you're ready to eat more when the mass gain starts and it attends to everything that you need. So not a huge modifier there. Number six, consider lower repetition ranges, especially towards the end of your bulk. Why? This is a bit counterintuitive. When you get fatter, okay, higher reps start to disproportionately suck, especially for what we call postural compounds, squats, deadlifts, bent over rows, standing barbell presses. You have to maintain your posture while doing reps. You guys know when you've balked before, your spinal erectors at some point are like, fuck this, I'm out. They cut that cord and your stiff-legged deadlift attempt for sets of 12 goes nowhere because by set number or rep number six, your lower back starts to round, it's fried, you can't feel your hams, you're like, dude, fuck this. A bulk powered primarily by slightly lower repetitions doesn't run into that problem because if you can't do sets of six, you're just too fat. You're not bulking, you're not bodybuilder, you're just fat piece of shit. I've been there, okay? Don't do that. But if you can do sets of five to 10, sets of 10 to 15, versus if you normally do a little higher reps, these can allow you, especially towards the end of your bulk when you're getting a little bit fatter, to not have to worry about the endurance component limiting you as much, and you can actually put in high quality work. And hey, bonus round, your leverages are fucking all our shit for being strong as fuck. So not only do you get high quality training that's not limited by your endurance capacity, but dude, you're fucking strong and it's easy to get motivated and be like, yeah, I'm doing squats for sets of six to eight, but holy fuck, am I squatting a lot for sets of six to eight? So it's kind of the mirror image of what you would do on a cut. Again, no dogma. Some of these work. Most of these work for most people. Some won't work for you. Give it some thought and try marginally a little bit implementing these slight movements into your next bulk, into your next cut. Let me know how you do. And if it doesn't work, you get a 100% money back guarantee. Since you don't fucking pay anything, you get zero back. JK, love you guys. See you next time.